think we're going to start. Well, welcome everybody to this very exciting, very exciting event for one who is technologically challenged to be running a seminar, webinar, um, with we think 170 people booked in. Uh, it's an extremely exciting thing to do. And I'd like to welcome you to Vimeac's first webinar in our What If series. This has been prompted by our desire to think about what would exist if the system were working the way we really want it to work. And we've started on this with a declaration which we presented to the minister last November and we've continued that work and we'll continue it over the next couple of months to make sure that the Royal Commission hears what we as consumers have to say. And we are delighted that 170 people have booked into this particular webinar because we are also very excited that we've been able to get Mary O'Hagan to speak. Before I introduce Mary, I'm going to ask Emily to, um, to talk about the process and how we're going to manage this because we thought there might be about 30 people, not 170. And before we do that, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the First Nations people, unceded land that was taken from them violently. And I want to acknowledge and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. I also want to thank the Indigenous people for holding this land safe and sacred for over 60,000 years for our benefit, not that they planned it that way, but in a way that ensured that they stayed connected to the mother. So, Emily, could you tell us how we're gonna make this happen? Absolutely, thanks Tricia. So, hi everyone, um, I'm Emily. I'm the communications officer here at Vimeac. So I just wanted to run through the process of today. Um, so Mary will be speaking for about 35 to 40 minutes. Uh, after her talk, um, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes where you can ask Mary any questions relating to the topic. Um, as there are, as Trisha said, a lot of you joining today, um, if you can refrain from calling out your questions and instead you'll see a little chat, which I see a few of you have already noticed, um, a little chat bubble at the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you can type in your questions there and then I will be able to relay them to Mary at the end. Um, we might not have enough time to get through everyone's questions, depending on how many there are, um, but we will pass these on to Mary um, and she'll be able to answer them offline and we'll be able to email them uh, to you after the webinar. So just a few very quick uh, Zoom etiquette uh, guidelines for today. So if we can just make sure that you're kept off mute for the entire time. Uh, we don't need any dogs barking halfway through. And uh, if we can also make sure that everyone's videos are turned off. Um, this is being recorded and will be put online. Um, so unless you want your face featured, that's fine. But if not, please do turn off your videos. Um, but yeah, any questions or uh, if there's any issues, please just put it on the chat um, and then we can take it from there. Thank you, Emily. And we don't mind a few faces. It's nice for us to be able to talk to people rather than a black screen. So if a few of you want to leave your faces up, we're delighted to see them. The topic today, as you all know, is what if the mental health system was designed by the people who use it? And Mary is an ideal person to speak to us about this. Mary is well known around the world in the mental health sector. She is a writer, she's a consultant, she is a worker, has been a worker in the area and has been influential in the way in which the New Zealand mental health system has developed. Uh, although she'll talk probably about some of the struggles in that as she talks today. Uh, she was a, um, a user of mental health services herself as a young woman and used that experience, uses that experience 
and her experience working in the sector to bring uh, new ideas, uh, straight answers to curly questions. Um, and she's very outspoken. Um, I have had the delight of working with her over the last few months and have found her extremely helpful and insightful. She speaks internationally, she works internationally, um, as well as in New Zealand. She's worked in Britain, Canada, Australia, and Norway. No, the Netherlands, wrong end. Um, she's a true pioneer. And she's taken the learnings that she had as a consumer and has used that to influence the development of the system. Many of you will have heard of Mary, will have heard her speak before, and we're delighted that you can be with us today. So Mary, welcome to Australia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> welcome to Vimiac. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to hand over to you. And for those of you that want to, put your questions in the chat room. Thank you, Mary. Uh, kia ora, um, Trisha, and um, uh, kia ora koutou um, to everyone here. I know some of you, uh, so it's really nice to see some familiar faces. Now, um, I've got a slideshow, so I'm going to do a screen share. And here it is. Uh, and I'm going to go, oh, just wait, I'm going to go on to um, slide. Um, is that, can you all see that? Uh, I know on Zoom, there's, sometimes you can move around your, you know, you can reduce the windows and move things around. So, um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to talk. I'm going to try not to take up all the time uh, because um, it's, you know, it's quite a long time to be talking and... Um, it will be really interesting. I'd be very interested to get your questions. Um, uh, Vimiak originally asked me to talk about the New Zealand reforms as though, uh, you know, we've done some great things here and um, I'm not so sure about that. So um, I said, why don't I talk about what if the mental health system was designed by the people who use it? Because I'm absolutely convinced that um, it would be very different. And I know that Vimiac has done work in this area with the declaration, some, some really nice work. And, and one of the things that I've done in my long career is, um, I mean, um, instead of just critiquing the system, I've always tried to come up with, um, with uh, visions for how things could be, uh, because I think um, a, a critique without a vision um, is, is a difficult thing for people, whereas if you give people a vision, uh, then they have much more to, to respond to. Now, I guess the process or the, the, the thing that we developed a couple of years ago um, uh, that was addressing this very issue was what we call the, the Wellbeing Manifesto for Aotearoa New Zealand. Now, Aotearoa is just the Māori word for New Zealand, uh, and it means the land of the long white cloud. And the, I'll tell you, there's a few clouds over it at the moment. It's been raining for about three days here. Um, so, um, so we uh, began, we, a, a group of us started, uh, mainly with lived experience, started working on this manifesto when we heard there was an inquiry into mental health and addiction in New Zealand. Um, and this was at the end of 2017. Uh, and um, and this, this picture here really encapsulates what we were after. So here you have uh, a cafe. Um, and uh, there's a banner over the cafe saying Hire am I, which means welcome. Welcome to all people with distress and addiction. The doors are open and uh, people can sit where they like and there's a menu and people have, can choose what they want from the menu. Um, uh, and that is a, a, an image of 
where we need to be going uh, because what we have at the moment is um, is people who shut doors and when uh, you're dragged in, sometimes, sometimes we're dragged in, uh, um, we get pills and pillows and that's really about it. Um, and uh, although there has been work done, I know in Victoria and other parts of Australia and in New Zealand on expanding the range of supports that people can get, um, the basic menu is still pills and pillows. So, um, so just a little bit of background. I'll talk a little bit about my own experience. These, um, these pictures really encapsulate aspects of my own experience. Um, I was a, a, a user of mental health services um, between about the ages of um, 18 and 27. Uh, it was an incredibly, um, uh, I can't even describe it, and many of you will understand this, it was an overwhelming, impossible, impossible, devastating, um, I don't know how many other superlatives I could use for it, uh, experience. It, it wasn't so much the, I mean, the experience itself was, was very, very difficult. But it was really other people's responses to it, uh, which was pretty devastating. Uh, and for me, especially the response I got from the services. Uh, and I, and, um, and uh, through that experience, I learned a huge amount about how to just live a life and how to live with difficulty. Um, not once did anyone in the services acknowledge that. They just saw me as a bundle of deficits. Uh, and, and being um, a, a reasonably rebellious and questioning young person was very helpful to me actually in this context because I really began to question their narrative. And um, when I was fortunate enough to leave that system, uh, I thought, I'm going to do something about this. That system is terrible and they need people like me who've been through it uh, to um, help them design a better way forward. And in various different ways, I've been doing that work ever since. Um, and uh, with, you know, mixed success. But anyway, here we go. So, so um, just a little bit about the mental health and addiction service in New Zealand. We have a population of 9 million people, and uh, 5 million. So that's probably about the population of Victoria. It might even be a bit, a bit less. So we're a little country. Uh, and, um, you know, we have about 16% of our population is Maori. About 75% is European. Um, we've got about 6% Pacifica. And, um, and virtually all our mental health services are publicly funded. We don't really have private psychiatry in New Zealand. I mean, we have a few psychiatrists who, who might uh, spend a day a week, um, you know, seeing people uh, privately, but um, there's, there's, it's, there's very little. And we really have a very socialised uh, medical um, health system. Now, uh, in New Zealand, at the moment about, actually it's a bit more at the moment, um, the latest figure I saw today was about 30% of our services are sort of NGO, primary health, community support and therapy services. Uh, now I think in Victoria, uh, that's only about 10%. And, um, and uh, in my view, um, you know, most of our services should be those kind of community-based support services, and a few of them should be the clinical services. But um, I think we've got it the wrong way around, the ratio of funding. And of course, other sectors fund or provide services in New Zealand too, as they do uh, in Australia. We have corrections provide some services for people, and um, uh, you know, the, the ministry, our social development ministry provides services and education. Um, but they're not joined up at all. They're just completely in their separate silos. Um, uh, so just a little bit about that. And then um, 
So I want to go, I want to talk a bit about why we, why we wrote the manifesto and why, and you know, what was really um, the thing that, why we think change is so uh, necessary. And look, um, uh, you know, people have got different nuanced views about this, but the longer I'm around, uh, the more I see that psychiatry has a legacy of what I call routine harm. That's not harm done by a few uh, because of ethical lapses or incompetence. It's actually harm that is built into the way psychiatry has been structured. And the kinds of harms I'm talking about are the harms that come from coercion, um, institutionalization, having a narrow focus on just pills and pillows, um, I mean, honestly, uh, these institutional services are incredibly expensive uh, to run. Uh, people can't get access, uh, they get late access, and, and actually uh, all the evidence that we have suggests that we get very poor outcomes from these expensive, coercive uh, services. Uh, and, and another thing is that um, you know, there's a history of protest. Um, now, you, some of you might remember that woman. Uh, she was a great mentor to me. Her name was Judy Chamberlain, and she died about 10 years ago. Uh, and, and the MAD movement um, and anti-psychiatry, there are two separate things, but um, sometimes people don't understand that. They've heavily critiqued uh, psychiatry uh, since the 1970s. And many of you will understand this very well. We've heavily critiqued the medical model and the deficits way of thinking, big pharma, coercion, and social exclusion. Uh, and, um, and, you know, but then, uh, you know, New Zealand was doing very well. Um, in the 1990s, we closed down all our hospitals, all our big old um, you know, psych hospitals. And that was, that was great progress, but, um, uh, and we were, we were starting to get a real reputation in the world, and then it all stopped. Uh, and, um, and, you know, for a decade or so there, uh, you know, felt like these surfers, you know, there's no wave coming. You know, everything's just stopped. Uh, and, um, and we really felt as though we were in the doldrums. But, you know, when the, uh, when the new inquiry was announced at the end of 2017, and it really has a lot of, um, and it's doing in some ways the same job as the Royal Commission in Victoria, uh, it gave us what we, we thought, you know, this is our Berlin Wall moment. This is when the forces of, um, of politics and history and social movements come together to create a moment of great change. And we felt it was the biggest opportunity for change in the history of services in New Zealand. Um, I have a slightly modified view about that uh, now, but this, is, this was our feeling. And, um, and so the mental health inquiry there was mounting public pressure in New Zealand. We had an, an election at the end of 2017 where our uh, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern became our Prime Minister. Uh, and, um, and they announced this inquiry just after they were elected. The inquiry took around the first 10 months of 2018 uh, and they reported to the government. And we, uh, we worked on the wellbeing manifesto uh, initially in um, uh, a peer zone, uh, which is the social enterprise I've been running, uh, we had a paradigm shift seminar, a peer-led paradigm shift seminar, and we put the building blocks of the wellbeing manifesto together. There was probably about 60 people worked on it on that day. And then we uh, shared it with other allies and experts um, over the next few months and, and refined it. Um, and then we handed it over to the panel, the inquiry panel, in, uh, about two years ago. And the key messages that came out of the um, wellbeing manifesto 
which is really a peer-led manifesto, was this. Um, that there's a big problem. And we talked about big psychiatry sitting at the hub of the system, shaping the worldview, using, using most of the resources, and actually doing routine harm. And, um, and we weren't suggesting that we shouldn't, we weren't saying we don't want psychiatry at all, because some people find psychiatry useful, um, but most people would say, yeah, oh, you know, what the psychiatry did was useful for me, but it was only 10 or 20% of what I needed. Uh, but, uh, but the trouble is that psychiatry, if it sits at the hub of the system, it takes a lot of the resources. And we think psychiatry should be one of the spokes of the system. And I've talked a bit about the, um, about the problems with psychiatry. Um, uh, there are multiple problems. And, you know, often when you talk to psychiatrists, they acknowledge these problems too. And um, just want to uh, talk a bit about what we mean by big psychiatry and big community. So in the, in the top column, you've got big, in the uh, left-hand column, we've got big psychiatry, and the right-hand column is big community. And, um, and uh, this, gives you, uh, this gives you an overview of where we're going with the wellbeing manifesto. So uh, in our big psychiatry system, which is pretty much where we are at the moment, mental disorder, they call it mental disorder, and that is a health deficit. Uh, in, in, in a big community system, uh, mental distress is seen as a recoverable life disruption. Um, and you'll see that in big psychiatry, um, you know, the only way you can get into it is through a health door. Uh, you know, your GP, the emergency room, or you might just get, get a private psychiatry appointment or a therapist appointment. You can't actually get in through any other door. And in a big community system, we need multiple entry points led by multiple sectors and communities. Now, um, in big psychiatry, as I've already said, most of the funding and resources is used for what I call pills and pillow services. And um, in, a, in a big community system, if you recall the, the, the menu blackboard in the first picture, uh, the resources are, are well distributed for a broad menu of services. Um, again, in a big psychiatry system, it's mostly medical and allied professionals, uh, and we're advocating in big community for an equal mix of peer, cultural, and professional workers. I mean, imagine if, if a third of the workforce was peer support workers and other peer workers. Um, one of the big pro problems with um, big psychiatry is there has been a legacy of paternalism and human rights breaches. And um, it's, it's, if you know anything about the history of psychiatry, it's enough to make you want to weep some of the things that have happened. Whereas big community has a, has a commitment to partnerships and human rights. Big psychiatry, as we all know, focuses on treatment compliance and risk management a lot. And there are lots of reasons for that. Uh, but, but they're not accountable for long-term outcomes at all. Um, and a, a big community system would be much more accountable for long-term outcomes, health and life outcomes. Um, so big psychiatry responds to risks with the Mental Health Act um, pills and uh, compulsion and hospitals. Um, and in a big community system, uh, we respond to risk with compassion and intensive support. Uh, and of course, big psychiatry is part of the colonizing infrastructure that came uh, to both our countries, and we need to recognize that. And of course, um, a big community needs to embrace multiple uh, worldviews, uh, and especially uh, our indigenous worldviews. So that just gives you a bit of an overview of where we're going. Uh, and um, I believe we're about here on the transition from big psychiatry to big community. We've started, but we've got a long, long way to go. Uh, and 
So just a few, we've got seven wellbeing priorities. Now, the word whānau in, in Māori means uh, extended family, all the people around you who are important to you. It's got a much broader meaning than family in English. So that's why, uh, one of the reasons we like to use it. Um, that we live in the social conditions that sustain well-being. So the well-being manifesto is across the spectrum. We do talk a lot about services, but we recognise that, that unless the system uh, addresses things across the system uh, in the promotion and prevention space, um, we're not going to get very far. So we live in social and economic conditions to sustain well-being. We all have the skills and supports to manage stress or to uh, respond to each other in our communities and our families. And we have access to services and supports to cover from, to recover from mental distress and addiction when we get down that end of the spectrum. And, um, and the second thing, uh, the second key point is a comprehensive responses for all. And we're after open access to a full menu of services, supports and opportunities to sustain and restore well-being. And uh, here's a wheel of, um, this is our big community wheel of responses. And I just wanted, so, so uh, people in their whanau uh, sustain well-being, they can manage stress and they can recover from distress and addiction. Now, um, this wheel, um, uh, so for instance, everyone, everyone uh, in order to sustain well-being needs what we call, you know, I don't know what the right term is, but well-being promotion and, you know, ways to self-manage and ways to support our communities and families to, to um, you know, to sort of work through the stresses of life. Um, and some of these things on the wheel, like, you know, psychiatric treatments or um, uh, community-based uh, home and crisis support are at the other end of the spectrum, uh, you know, for people who are undergoing, you know, uh, having a really bad time. And we're not suggesting that everyone needs all these, uh, all these, or that everyone needs them all at once. But these are the things that people tell us they want, you know, particularly when they are having a, uh, they are experiencing mental distress. Um, and for instance, when I was when I was uh, going through services some time ago now, all I got was psychiatric treatments and hospital, um, and I got virtually nothing else. Um, and so, wouldn't it be wonderful uh, if we had access also to advocacy? to navigation through the system, to cultural or spiritual healing, to things that give us community connection, uh, like going to, uh, you know, a yoga class or, you know, doing art or creative stuff, um, or, you know, doing volunteer stuff or wh whatever it is, just stuff that keeps us connected or being a part of our neighbourhoods. I mean, stable and secure housing. Having good physical health care uh, and, uh, you know, for those of us who want them, having psychiatric treatments. Um, I've got here community, uh, we, we chose community and home-based crisis support because actually in our world, we don't, we don't, we think there's a very, very small place for hospitals. We think that virtually everyone should be able to, uh, uh, should be able to be supported in their crisis in their homes or in community in community places um, and uh, so we don't see really a place for hospitals and um, very upset that the commission has uh, recommended 170 hospital beds and I've told them that uh, talking therapies uh, income support for those of you, uh, those of us who are, are having a struggle with uh, income. Uh, education and employment support and whānau and parenting support. So we think if, if uh, all of us had access to these things, the well-being of the whole community would be 
would be much greater. And also the well-being of people who uh, experience distress. So the other thing we want um, in, in our big community system is cultural and peer workers work alongside the, tradi the traditional workforce with equal status and in equal numbers. I mean, imagine that. Wouldn't that be fantastic? I'd just think, wow. Um, perhaps not in my lifetime. What we want to do, when you see that wheel of responses, you think the health sector doesn't uh, provide a lot of that. So how are we going to get all those responses available to people? And our answer to that is we need multi-sector community-led funding. So what we said is all the sectors that have responsible for well-being, distress and addiction, not just health, but you know, social services, justice, corrections and education, need to jointly fund a full menu of services at the local or district or regional level in partnership with people affected by distress and addiction. And what that would lead to then would be much more integrated community delivery so that the services, supports and opportunities, because I think what we need, you know, we don't always need services and supports, we need doors open for us, we need opportunities. And so I think we need to build that into the whole system. They need to be based in communities, not hospitals or clinics, and co-delivered, probably under as few roofs as possible. It might be in community settings, it might be in primary health settings, in Marae, which is a Māori uh, meeting space, uh, community centres, schools, or in large workplaces. So that you have um, a place where you can go, where you can um, access a lot of those things around the wheel without having to navigate a huge system or go into lots of different spaces to, to try and find it. Um, oh, sorry about that. What's that all about? Okay. So, um, so and in order for this system to work, we need active bipartisan government support. Um, the government would need to articulate the, the vision, provide the regulation in order for this to happen, to force all these sectors to, to plan and fund together and, and deliver together, to fund uh, social inclusion programs with urgency, um, anti-discrimination um, programs, uh, and we've had one in New Zealand for 23 years. Um, lead public acknowledgement of big psychiatry harm. Uh, I think um, uh, there are signs that psychiatry is starting to apologize to indigenous people, uh, to, to uh, the rainbow community, uh, but actually they need to apologize to everyone. Uh, and, um, and or just or just publicly acknowledge that we did harm and we need to draw a line in the sand and and uh, and do th and do things differently repeal mental health laws in line with UNCRPD and UNCRPD is the U the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and and most of the interpretations that have come out of uh, UNCRPD would suggest that actually, uh, um, you know, um, mental health laws aren't, uh, uh, are, a, are kind of a breach of this convention, which has been signed up to by Australia and New Zealand. Um, uh, measuring well-being as well as wealth, and uh, our country is embarking on that. Uh, we think in order to really um, do something about the social determinants of distress, the best place to invest is in the first three years of life. There's quite a lot of evidence of that. And of course, uh, reducing the social determinants. Um, and we, we, I'm sure that many of us uh, know what they are from both our personal experience and, and what we know. And so um, there are some three big implications to this vision and um, and uh, there's a website uh, that you can go to which is just um, I'll write it up in the chat at the end um, but um, 
really the first big implication is the, is the end of a health-led system. And the longer I do this, um, the more I think that we are not going to get the sort of system we want if we have a health-led system. Uh, and I don't think many people get that. I don't think maybe the Royal Commission gets it in Australia. I don't think our inquiry in New Zealand, um, they might have got it in, in some way, but they didn't articulate it in their, in their um, report very well. Uh, and I think, um, I think uh, they, it's, it would be a huge disruption uh, to psychiatry, actually, uh, and to some other interest groups if we went down this track. But to me, this is the structural change that we need. And, and we know that the health sector and health professionals have a role, um, but they can't deliver open access to that full menu of services. And they can't deliver the outcomes that we need uh, because they've got such a narrow focus. Uh, and it would be unfair for them to say, well, if you prescribe a person a pill, uh, you, then you need to be um, responsible for the fact that they get a job or a stable housing. Uh, what they need to do is join up with the sectors that do these things to create a pretty seamless approach for people. So the manifesto proposes that funding not going to health services. So when we say multi-sector funding, we want to pull the we want to pull the money, the mental health money out of health and put it in the and pull it with other sectors where they do the planning and funding uh, for their region or district. The other implication for us is uh, Māori ownership of services. Um, now, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail because this is a very local issue, very hot issue, that Māori need to plan and deliver services for Māori. Uh, we have a treaty uh, that, um, that uh, you know, after 150 years, we started taking seriously. Um, and the, the thing about um, Māori ownership is that there are many uh, aspects of Māori uh, culture that uh, we want to assimilate into our white culture because they, they have some values there and you can see them on there. Um, araha, manakitanga, wairuatanga, whakapapa, uh, tūranga waiwa and whānau ora. These are all very strong values in their culture and we think they're missing in a lot of our systems and we'd like our systems to bring those values in. So it's not just a matter of Māori for Māori, it's also, um, it's also uh, how we can absorb those values because after all, they've, they've, they've uh, compulsorily had to absorb uh, the culture that we brought with us. And then um, repeal of the Mental Health Act. Uh, and as I said, um, the UN Convention uh, really, uh, particularly in Articles 12 and 14, sort of says, you know, you can't do this anymore, states. Um, uh, but there's been a lot of pushback from member states about this. They're pretty slow learners, um, some of them. They're, um, uh, some of the states are, uh, you know, in a state of denial and uh, they do huge mental gymnastics to tell themselves that they're complying with the convention. So, I uh, just want to say the report. Um, I do what, uh, what, how am I doing for time? How am I doing for time? Yeah, I think we're okay. Okay. So, I've got a three minute video here. This is a, this is, a little bit about what's in the report. And you know, there are a lot of good things about the report. I didn't think it went far enough, but uh, I will just play this for you now. Early in 2018, the government set up an inquiry to look at how we should change the mental health and addiction system. 
six panel members went out to hear the voices of the community on what's working, what's not, and what could be done better. Over 5,000 people told us what they thought in submissions. Many more had their say in hundreds of meetings from Kaitaia to Invercargo. We've heard from people with mental health and addiction challenges, people working to support them, families, whānau, and people who've lost someone to suicide. We recommend making big changes in 10 areas and putting more government money into mental health and addiction. One, give people more access to services and more choice. Get support to more people. Right now, we aim to help the 3% of our people who need it most, but 20% of our people are dealing with some sort of problem at any one time. So we should set a higher target to get more people help sooner. Give people more choices about what sort of support they get, like someone to talk to, someone who understands your culture, or help with alcohol and other drugs. And give people more support in their communities. Everybody needs to work together to make these changes. Two, transform primary health care. Make primary care work better for mental health and addiction. For instance, with the sort of support people can get at their GP. Three, support non-government organisations. Make it easier for NGOs to help people in their communities. That includes Kaupapa Māori services. Make a government be responsible for supporting NGOs. Four, prevent problems and promote well-being. Government agencies to work together better to prevent problems in the first place. One should take the lead on social well-being. That means getting the basics right, like a good start for kids, good jobs and housing, being connected to your community and culture, and being protected from things like violence, abuse, bullying, and discrimination. Five, put people at the center. Give people who need support more say in how things are set up and run. If people want, make it easier for their families and whānau to get information and be part of their care and make sure the carers get enough help to do it. Six, take strong action on alcohol and other drugs. Be stricter on selling and supplying alcohol. Treat drug addiction as a health problem. Give people more help with addictions. Offer them more services from detox and rehab to help in their community and set up stronger government leadership. Seven, prevent suicide. Get the National Suicide Prevention Strategy finished urgently. Reduce the suicide rate by 20% by 2030. Set up a suicide prevention office. Put more money into preventing suicide. Give more help to families and whānau who have lost someone and investigate deaths more quickly with less stress and cost to families. Eight, reform the Mental Health Act. Change the law to give more protection to people's human rights. Allow them to make more of their own decisions with support and make the law work better to help them get well and stay well. Nine, Set up a new Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission. It should take the lead in changing the way the system works and be the watchdog. 10. Look at the big picture. The government's now reviewing the whole health and disability system. So think about mental health and addiction when looking at things like how district health boards, GPs and community services should work. And finally, get political parties working together on mental health and well-being. We need to make big changes on mental health and addiction. That will take time, but we need to start now. We're stronger when we work together. We can make things much better. Okay, so... Um, uh that's a, a you know a pretty nifty summary of what was in the report. Um, we were a bit disappointed 
uh, and our verdict was there was a lot of good stuff in there, but um, some of the big issues that matter to people with lived experience and whānau weren't, we didn't think they were emphasised enough. And as I said, such as the end of a health-led system, they didn't really talk much about lived experience, leadership, peer support, Māori for Māori, or the end of compulsory treatment. Um, you know, primary mental health services got a huge budget boost in 2019. But, you know, you get a sense it's gap-filling. There's no real paradigm shift happening. Um, and at the same time, you worry about this, the kind of specialist mental health services are at risk of being neglected. Um, and um, there's no signs of any bigger investment in the promotion and prevention end of things. Ah, so that is my talk. And, um, and I will stop the screen sharing now. And I'm very happy to take your look at your comments and questions. So, well, thank you, Mary. I don't oh, know God. how you clap on. Um, maybe we we'll, <laughs> <laughs> um, on, on Zoom. Uh, we wave. Um, Emily, do you have a couple of questions there? Yeah, so um, as mentioned at the beginning, because there's so many people on this call, if you have any questions for Mary relating to this topic, if you can just send it through on the chat, um, which I think most of you know where that is now, um, and if we can't get through everyone's questions, um, we'll make sure that we send them to Mary and she can answer them offline and I'll, I'll email all the answers around. So does anyone have any questions for Mary? Uh, there's, I'm just looking here. <laughs> Quite a few technical issues going on here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can't answer those questions. Um, uh, so, yeah, I don't know if there's any questions here, are there? Yeah, so um, Catherine has asked if there's any advice for someone wanting to follow your lead and work towards changing the system as a person with lived experience. Well, you know, I gave a talk once called... Um, changing, you know, I think it was called something like changing the system advice from a failure. <laughs> so, and not that I think I've been a personal failure at all, but uh, I think it's a very, very, um, it's a very challenging area to be in. Um, and so what advice would I give? I, you've got to be in for the long game. Uh, I think we have to, uh, as I said before, you, you have to paint a picture for people about how things could be, um, uh, because otherwise, you know, you're just critiquing what's there, and I don't think that's necessarily constructive. Um, uh, and you know, I was just talking about this to someone today. I'm, I'm, um, I'm pretty. Um, after all this, these years I've been doing this, I feel quite uh, sad and angry about the lack of change. And, um, and, and you know, how do you handle that sadness and anger uh, when you're in public, you know, when, when you're out there doing the work? Uh, and one of the things I do is I, um, I remember that this is not about individuals, generally. It's about, um, you know, it's about a, a it's it's about a, a culture that allows these things to happen, and the systems that sit in that culture, and the individuals are just little pawns going around uh, trying to do their best in a very crappy system, um, uh, quite often. I mean, there are some bad, and there are some individuals who are, are, are bad, but generally speaking. Um, most people are in there trying to do, uh, do good things. Uh, and so I think we need to treat people, even when we disagree with them, uh, we need to treat them with respect and, um, and uh, hold, our, hold our anger, if we have that, um, uh, not, not you know, spill it over into our interactions with people. Um, generally speaking. Sometimes anger is appropriate, but um, m more often it's probably not. Um, I mean, it expressed anger, uh, and you can always go home and kick the cushion or whatever. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so the, the, the um, someone's saying here that the, uh, I, I'm pretty upset about, I mean, if, if I was a bit disappointed in the, our inquiry, I'd be even more disappointed in what the, um, what the Victorian Commission is coming out with. Um, and, and I was pretty furious, actually, when uh, I learnt that no one with lived experience was on that uh, panel. Um, I, you know, I couldn't believe it, uh, you know, on the commission panel. So, um, so about lived experience, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, someone's asking if there's conversation about lived experience run organisations and commissioning. Um, uh, I don't think there's been enough discussion about that. I think what's happening in New Zealand is that the, um, uh, you know, we used to have a lot more lived experience run, peer run organisations, uh, and they all got absorbed. Uh, and so we haven't got a VIMIAC in New Zealand. What, and, and I think that's a real strength that you have. And, um, and we don't have, you know, like there are other states as well that have peak lived experience bodies in them. Uh, and our government just never really supported it. Uh, well, not since the early 90s. And, and so I think that's, a, that's something that you really, is a great strength uh, in Australia. Um, yeah, the um, Australian government got a caning. Yes, yes, well, uh, yes, that's good. Are they, it's a, uh, um, uh, yeah. Uh, Katrina's, actually, uh, Katrina's also asked uh, for lived experience researchers in the space, what research or interventions are needed to help nudge the system, given the limited scope of system change that the researchers have? Uh, what do, how can researchers contribute? Yeah, um, and, and what can they do? What research or interventions are needed to help give the system a nudge? In the right from, direction. A, from a research perspective, yeah. Um, I hate to say this, but re research has less influence on systems than we'd like to think. In fact, um, I, you know, uh, if we if we followed the research, we would downsize our hospitals tomorrow, and we'd be. Um, creating community-based and home-based alternatives. The research is there. Uh, it's whether people have the will uh, to uh, do, to follow the evidence. Uh, and that's where the big gap is. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I'm a great supporter of um, uh, research that's led by people with lived experience. And, um, and uh, MAD studies. Now I know there's a, what they call, a, what, what I think is a very misnamed network called the Service User Academia Network, I think it's called, and they have a conference every year, usually in Australia and New Zealand. And um, I've been telling them for years, stop calling yourself service user researchers. You know, you're only a service user when you're using a service. You're not a service user when you're being a researcher. Um, and uh, the other thing about that is that I would love to see med studies departments because what we have at the moment is a lot of, you know, lived experience researchers who are, you know, um, who are kind of giving advice or, or on hanging off the coattails of other people's research and maybe not setting the agenda as much as we could if we had our own departments and things, you know, departments of mad studies. Hi, I'm afraid that we've reached the end of the session. Uh, I would like to thank Mary and uh, we'll do it by wiggly hands. Um, and I would like to thank everybody for joining us. We are going to have one of these each week for the next seven or eight weeks. So keep your eyes open. 
The topics are going to be really interesting and help us. This will help us present a vision to the Commission on what if the system was working for the advantage of consumers. Uh, what if the vision was was actually able to be implemented? And the declaration started that, this is continuing it, and there's some other work that Vimiac is doing that will um, help us with that, and we'll be doing that over the next couple of months uh, before the Commission finishes its work. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Emily, for your hard work in getting this to happen. Uh, thank you, Emily. And again, thank you, Mary. Oh, well, look, it's been, it's been a, a, a delight to be able to uh, present to you. And just so I'm presenting to the Commission, um, I've done a statement or someone wrote a statement for me out of interviews, which was very kind of them. And so um, I've, I've, um, uh, I've, you know, I'm really taking an interest in how things uh, are going to progress uh, in Victoria. So all the best with it. And uh, lovely to see you all, those of you who I can see. Thank you, Barry. And for the others that are still online, we have some questionnaires on our website that relate to some of the issues for the Commission. And we will be having a couple of workshops around some of the recommendations and particularly about what should be in place to govern the mental health system, both at the systems level and at the clinical level. And if you're interested in any of those, go to the website and register your interest. We'd be delighted to have your voice there. Thank you very much. Have a nice evening. Bye.